Hello, thank you for joining us today. Um, we have an hour for a webinar focusing on the digital future of mental health and its workforce. So my name is Tina Marshall and I'm from Vaseba Care. We're market leaders in providing a white label digital solution for healthcare providers to see their patients. Today, I'm joined by, uh, it's actually a truly amazing panel. So we have Dr. James Wooler from NHS e &I, Henrietta Mivia Bankers from Health Education in the England, and Dr. Kate Lovett, who's the Dean um, of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Today, so we, as I've said, we're going to be discussing a topic that is dear to my heart, is actually marrying up digital technology with mental health. And we can talk about some context. All of us, I'm very familiar with it, I'm sure. But the news and everything that's happening right now, PTSD for healthcare professionals, for parents, for students, for young children. There isn't one person that I, that I know actually who isn't touched by everything that's happening right now. And a recent study regarding the, the mental state of the NHS workforce during the pandemic showed actually some alarming results. 45% of the survey respondents, including healthcare professionals from six NHS hospitals reported symptoms consistent with PTSD, anxiety and severe depression. One in seven of those clinicians reported self-harm and suicidal ideation. Over 1,000 clinicians are planning to quit the NHS after the pandemic and over 35,000 full-time staff dates were lost in a single trust in a three month period and a third of those were attributed to mental health related absences. Mental health, absence, uh, men mental health related absences rose 36% um, in spring compared to the whole of 2019. So this is data that is being reported and it's happening right now. While the NHS has, an, has invested an additional 15 million pounds for NHS mental health support and trusts are taking actions to to redeploy returning staff and to help our staff, there is an arsenal of tools that possibly aren't being deployed as effectively as we probably need to see right now. One mental health um, respondent in the survey actually said that our consultations were via phone. They weren't as effective. And unfortunately, the consultations that took place this way did not prevent her from being sectioned for three weeks due to the mental health issues. And there are lots of things that could be said around this. We don't know precisely her story, um, but it's something that we need to bear in mind when we're looking at how we can help our workforce and how we can help our population who are dealing with mental health issues. Research has also shown that online therapy is as effective as face-to-face -face therapy. So why do we need to pick up the phone? There is financial ROI related to online therapy um, that you that you would that trust hospitals healthcare providers would be able to reap the benefits of compared to face to face and particularly at this time when we need to make sure that we see patients as opposed to um, you know letting them them flounder or, or or essentially not being open to them being able to see us at all so during this time um, our panel would like to answer a few questions for you can digital technology help? And how can digital technology help? It's all very well for us to sit there and say, we have a great system for you to use, but how can you actually use it? And can you actually deliver the change, the value and the efficiency savings that you need to have to make a difference to the patients that you're going to be seeing today? So I'm going to start and I'm going to ask um, Dr. James Willard to start for us. Dr. James is the National Specialty Advisor for NHS PNI. So thank you, James. Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, thank you uh, for my slides there. Um, so yeah, just to uh, set the scene in terms of uh, my other hats that I wear. So I work uh, a few days a week at NHS England and Improvement as the National Specialty Advisor for Digital Mental Health. Uh, but I also am a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist and the Chief Clinical Information Officer at Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust. And I suppose my talk today reflects wearing all three of those hats, both my direct clinical experience, thinking about some of the work that I've done in my National Specialty Advisor role over the last few years in thinking about digital in mental health services, and also as a Chief Clinical Information Officer, trying to lead an organization of uh, 5,000 uh people through a kind of digital transformation which is the kind of 
uh, term that we often hear around digital, that transformation word. So um, if I could have my next slide, please. Thanks very much. So um, back in 2018, um, Tom Foley and I, who's another child and adolescent psychiatrist, was working at NHS Digital at the time, at the time as a, uh, one of their clinical leads, uh, wrote the, a Topol, uh, uh, a section for the Topol Review. The Topol Review, Eric Topol, a fabulous American uh, physician who is very interested in the role of digital in care and has written lots of excellent books thinking about how technology can change the, the power dynamic between uh, patients and professionals. So the Topol Review was commissioned by the then Secretary of State, uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt, to look at how can how is technology going to impact on the workforce over the next 20 years? Uh, I think Henrietta might speak a bit more to this, so I, I, I'm not gonna uh, kind of steal too much of her thunder, but if I can have my next slide, please. So uh, this slide is supposed to be overwhelming. It, it, what we found when Tom and I looked at the technology that may influence uh, mental health care over the next uh, 20 years, we found such a, a, an ecosystem, a, a rich ecosystem of technology that most of which is already being trialed in, in academia, some of which is in uh, kind of common use already. So when we think about uh, sensor uh, platforms like wearables, many of you on the line might be wearing Fitbits or other forms of uh, wearable technology, Apple watches and so forth, which can monitor your heart rates. There's been studies that, for example, at, at, at the Institute of Psychiatry, looking at how we can use wearables to monitor sleep patterns in those with psychosis and, and looking at the variation in sleep patterns. So this stuff is definitely going on. How do we make the best use of, of those uh, sensor platforms, those wearables? Thinking about things even like um, we think smartphones are the, are the kind of commonest way that we interact with the internet. Actually, is that gonna change? There's been some attempts like Google Glasses, which some of you may have seen uh, to change the way. I suspect that's, you know, in 10, 20 years, the smartphone may not be the main way that we interact with the internet, if you like, in that connected world. Then we're thinking about uh, even things like uh, nanotechnology delivering drugs differently to the brain in much more specified ways uh, much more targeted ways one of the difficulties uh, with medication is we can't we can't hone in on where it needs to go in the body we have to give it to the whole body and that's what leads often to those side effects that uh, can be uh, really troublesome for some people um, thinking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, lots of that already going on in mental health. I was speaking to a researcher earlier looking at how we can look at the re medical records that doctors have written over and nurses have written over the many years. Can we get information, richer information, understand and analyze those patterns of behavior and think about how we can predict uh, people's uh, uh, perhaps relapse into, into worse mental health? Um, all of this works together. I haven't even mentioned about genetic testing. That isn't necessarily going to be very important in terms of mental health over the next 20 years. But thinking about physical health conditions in those also who have mental health conditions, can we predict your cardiovascular risk score, which we monitor better? So just setting out that richness, many of this, most, much of this technology, if not all of it, is over the horizon for many uh, NHS services at the moment. Little signs in academia that it's coming along. So. That, let's think about what's over. That's thinking about what's over that horizon. But let's think about what's happened uh, in the net, in the last eighteen months or so. If I can have my next slide, please. Some of you may have seen this cartoon, COVID nineteen, the biggest driver of digital transformation. Certainly in the NHS, that's what a lot of people have said. We didn't see it coming. We've had to deal with it. We're on. We're doing this webinar via video. Many of you may have spent most of the morning on Microsoft Teams or other platforms doing uh, clinical work with your patients. Uh, so it has been a huge change in in using technology. And my talk was about cultures and practices and thinking about the cultures and practices the workforce need to take. And I suppose we've really had to think about our cultures and practices in terms of how we change the way that we use technology. I think digital, and there's a difference between using video and doing digital, if you like, in mental health, doing digital takes that bit further. And I guess what I'd like to do for the rest of my talk is just think about that difference. We've done video in many mental health services in terms of using video call and clinical practice. Let's think about how we take that a little bit further and how we make the best use of video uh, that we are using now. So if we can reflect, if we can reflect uh, on what we've learned, let's move on to my next slide. 
so this model is uh, published by the Royal Society of Arts, the RSA, a really good blog on thinking about how we reflect. If one of the digital practices that I've learned, which fits with our mental health care and our mental health practice often is about reflection in, in agile processes, uh, we call that retrospective kind of uh, 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 meetings where you look at what's worked, what hasn't worked and what we do differently. And I think if we think about that, one of the things that I want to get back to it, or not or to, to stop doing when this uh, pandemic is over is stop posting prescriptions we had great problems with uh, getting people prescriptions over the over the christmas period because of the the jammed christmas post so that meant a delay in care that's not great we need to do something about that in terms of digital uh, one of the things that i think we've learned that we'd like to keep doing is not traveling to meetings i think some of my colleagues have been able to go to more uh, care meetings in terms of discharge meetings for people coming out of hospital or people going into hospital in terms of that. They've been able to do more of that because they haven't been ha having to travel between sites. So I think that's something we probably want to keep doing. What we want to restart is face-to-face -face, uh, training, particularly for me simulation, and I'll say a bit more about that uh, in terms of high fidelity simulation and how that's a good way of exploring technology in, in a few slides time. Uh, I think what I've learned is that when we see, um, when we interact with people via video, we do get more. And I think, you know, I think hopefully Kate will maybe share some of her experiences from that, but certainly my experience is having an insight into people's homes and lives does bring a richness that you don't get when you see them in clinic or via telephone. So if I can have my next slide, please. So complexity is, is a huge problem when it comes to thinking about technology. And, and, and if there's one thing that the cultures and practices of the digital, of the internet age, it has, it has to be about dealing with complexity. And Chris Greenhouse and a team at Oxford have come up with this non-adoption scale up and spread, which looks at the reasons of why technology isn't adopted in the NHS. And so much of it is because we make it more complex than it has to be, or we don't manage complexity. Um, and complexity is about that unpredictability that, um, so it's not, so the difference between com uh, complicated is that it might be a series of steps, but they're predictable. Complexity is about a series of steps that are unpredictable. And it looks at various domains in terms of complexity and thinking about staff, what are the elements of complexity around involving staff? What's the value proposition for uh, services, for staff, for patients? How do we manage that value proposition to reduce that complexity? So I think one of the things we've got to think about when we're thinking about moving towards that horizon of digitally enabled mental health care is managing complexity at every stage. I think in some ways COVID has simplified so much. It's reduced complexity. We've had to think about uh, uh, only one thing, really. And maybe that's one of the driving factors of why COVID has allowed us to do so much in the last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, next slide, please. So thinking about that complexity, how do we manage that with our staff? How do we help them navigate uh, the complex environment of digital? Um, and I think one of the things we've been talking about in Oxys recently is what do we keep doing and how do we help staff keep doing it? In achieving a, a state of wisdom, I suppose, around technology, around digital. And that's about perhaps frameworks for helping them uh, to make good decisions about when to use technology and when not to use technology. I think we're still learning about that. So I think those frameworks to support decision-making, when's the right time to use and recommend an app and when's the not right time to recommend an app is an important. I, I'm really keen on the digital navigator role developed by John Torres and colleagues. John Torres is um, perhaps the closest America has to somebody in my role. He works for the American Psychiatric Association, runs a digital clinic in uh, Boston. He's developed this digital navigator role. These are um, uh, not necessarily uh, clinicians. They could be people with a background in technology or assistant psychologists who are interested in technology who come in and support uh, staff to think about how to best use technology. They work with um, uh, patients and families and carers to think about how they can adapt and use the technology in the similar way I think to pharmacists do at the moment in, in supporting other clinicians to make the best use of medication and supporting carers and patients to make the best use of the medication they're prescribed. Uh, one of the things I've been working on in Oxys is around developing communication skills around digital. Uh, um, I, I'm rather frustrated that I haven't been able to finish this project because of the, the lockdown but we were looking to use uh, high fidelity simulation experiences to help staff practice talking about digital technology. I think so much of what we do is, is about a, 
a, a, a habit, if you like, a kind of pattern of language and explaining things to patients. We've got used to that in terms of traditional uh, mental health interventions, but I think simulation allows us to create those safe, playful spaces where we can explore talking about these new ways of working. Uh, maybe COVID hasn't given us the luxury of doing that with our video and we've jumped in uh, uh, two foot into the deep end. And I think we've probably now got a chance to do a retrospective and reflection on that and maybe try simulation in that way. Care planning. I'd love it if every time we, we had a care planning conversation with, with our patients and carers, we simply asked two questions. How does technology help you stay mentally healthy and how does it get in the way? And maybe that's a question for all of us. I know I certainly have habits around technology which aren't always great for my mental health and maybe there's some things I need to stop uh, as well. So if I can have my next slide, please. So one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about at the center, but also we've been trying in Oxley's is about using the practices of user-centered design. User-centered design is a critical practice in when we're thinking about digital. And what's the difference between user-centered design and co-production that, uh, uh, um, that you may have come across in mental health care? Co-production is about perhaps getting uh, all the different users you've got uh, around a, a particular problem uh, into a room and asking them what they want. User-centered design is following them in their real lives and understanding what they need in their context. And that's the difference. This is a, an experience map, an empathy map, if you will, of a journey through our child and adolescent services in uh, Oxleys. The pink notes are the uh, pain points where things are painful, if you like, in terms of that, that user experience, both for staff and for, for patients. Those yellow ones are the technology-based opportunities that we came up with. And this user-centered design approach helps us think about uh, uh, ideas that we want them want to test and through those agile project management processes such as you know small tests it's very similar to quality improvement it just has slightly more methodology around that user-centered approach so i would recommend if there was one thing that i want our team leaders in mental health to think about and embed in terms of our leadership fluency it's around user-centered design and service design more generally if I can have my next slide, please. So one of the things that we're going to deal with in the next few years as clinicians is connected systems. We're going to have so much more information at our fingertips, both through those wearables that we might be getting data from our patients, but also from our primary care record. At the moment, I can see a, a, a really helpful extract of our primary care record. That information might feel overwhelming. And I think, again, uh, uh, a kind of interface that helps us, if you like, a, a way of seeing that information that helps us make decisions is going to be critical. One of the things we need to do, I think, to help all staff around their well-being, but also just around kind of our service delivery, is improving the efficiency and staff experience of our electronic records. I think that does so much uh, in, in terms of getting in the way of us doing our jobs. And I think everyone knows that. And we're working really hard in our CCIO community and our chief information officer, those digital leaders within organizations, to try and improve that usability of electronic systems. I think that will reap uh, great uh, rewards. Um, and I think one of the things I just want to reflect on is my experience of developing a shared health record system in Oxys. That's where we bring young people and families into a shared connected space and allow a different form of communication. Um, allows us to stay in touch for the patient and the family and the carer to be more in control. We're now scaling this across Oxleys as a as a record called Oxcare, which will mean our clinicians and our patients can interact very differently uh, in a shared virtual space. And I think that, again, if Eric Topol highlighted how technology can change the power balance uh, between patients and carers, uh, sorry, patients and professionals, I think that sort of shared care record is one example. It's going to challenge us around our workforce because there's going to be more transparency, perhaps, around what we record about our patients. And that's going to change the way that perhaps we have a conversation with the people that we care for. I think overall, hopefully, we achieve better population health management. And I think I've got uh, one more slide, I hope, um, which is just thinking about uh, taking this step back to an organizational level. How do we achieve agility? Uh, and that's an ability to constantly adapt and change, take new ideas, make use of them. And I think that agility is about uh, understanding the principles of change, many which are overlap with quality improvement, just that small test, iterate, keep trying it, keep changing, be playful, create the spaces where you can be playful coordination there's one thing that i'd love everybody to understand that which is conway's law so in software development they talk about um conway's law which is that 
how you communicate as teams influences the software you produce. And I think that is so true of the care that we provide in Oxley's and other organizations, how we communicate as teams, making sure that we've got those multidisciplinary, and when I mean multidisciplinary, I don't mean the traditional model of clinicians, I mean technology experts, I mean change experts coming together as multidisciplinary teams and communicating together. That's that MDT experience that's central to processes like agile tech, agile project management. I think there are some critical things around clinical safety, around outcome measures that we need to embed in our processes. So if we're thinking about an organizational level, you've got to get that agility right through that process. And I think that's it from me. Um, looking forward to questions later on. Back to you, Tina. Thank you. Um, thanks, James. The back to you, Tina, sounded like, <laughs> like your radio presenter. I loved it. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I particularly love the way that you're looking at, at service design um, for your patients, actually, and you're looking at digital transformation as a whole. You know, as you say, video has been around for such a long time, but for you to actually deliver the efficiency savings, you need to look at things as a whole, and it doesn't necessarily need to be hard. I mean, we were quite lucky. Um, one of our one of our customers actually also like you. They have the digital navigators, the the floor workers who were on the, who who were just walking around, helping everybody with their tech. And just in six months, they reduced their DNA rate by ten percent. Um, you know, and all of those small things can really help. So I know that we'll touch on that, and we're also getting some really good questions. Um, so before we move on to Henrietta, I will just say I'll drop a link in for the um, the the mental health. Um, paper that I talked about in my opening. Um, but for now, I'd like to move over to, to Henrietta, please, from Health Education England. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. So, um, James, I, I thought now that James has done such a, a, a detailed talk, just for me to focus on what does that mean for our workforce. So, everything that James has said is quite key in terms of um, um, the changing worlds that we are in. So as already introduced, I'm currently leading on a number of projects and like James, I wear a few hats. Um, so I'm head of blended learning at Health Education England, looking at how we utilize blended learning approaches in our training of the workforce, and but also looking at digital literacy as a key to a lot of the implementation of digital and digital skills. I must say I am really fortunate to be one of the NHS clinical entrepreneurs and being mentored by James. So glad, glad to be on this session with him. So what are we talking about here? I think really in terms of all the descriptions that's been given and uh, certainly being part of the topo review as well, we do know that the, the scope of the challenge is huge. Certainly from a health education perspective, this is something that we are addressing, not just for the health workforce of about 1.39 million as of, as of June 2020, but we're also looking at this from the perspective of social care as well. So for us, it is a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge on the basis that we actually have individuals within our organizations, not just clinicians, but people with wide ranging roles. So clinical and non-clinical roles, administrative support roles. It is quite wide ranging in terms of these roles. The skills and ability levels are varied as well. And we do know that individual attitudes to learning and addressing learning needs are different. Um, and then organizational difference. I always say that actually, if you look at organi the organizations that we all work in, they're a huge organization. And sometimes whilst there might be um, an organizational aspiration, even when you go into specific teams or specific areas, there are uh, different um, training cultures or commissioning and processes going on. All of this will only happen if we pay attention to patient and citizens education. So whilst this is focusing on 3.1 million people who are one point, maybe professionals, on another point, they will be citizens. And the way that I see it, if, if we can start um, getting our workforce to be digitally literate, then there is a real potential to support the wider patient and citizen population. Like everything else, Evidence is key to what we do because it really does give us insights into which areas we need to be thinking about or investing in. James has already highlighted a number of the types of, uh, of you know, digital or change that we will see in our digital world. Some we thought at the time of doing the topo review, we thought 
was going to come in in five years time and we've seen that as a result of the um, of the pandemic some have actually um and been accelerated and we're beginning to see some of those types of changes now the scale of it is huge so um in in a piece of work that mckinsey and co did in 2018 looking at five industries health was i mean the industries they looked at mining insurance retail uh, banking and health and health was the area that was going to need digital skills or technical skills the most in actual fact it was five times more than the other um, four industries and the rate of change is i think it's faster than our ability to adapt to that so with that in mind it's about how do we get our staff really skilled and able to utilize um, the technologies that are available to us. The picture is quite mixed in terms of self-reported digital skills for our various professions. A number of survey, survey outcomes shows that either professionals are reporting themselves as having high skills or as low skills. So it is quite a mixed picture. Having said that, there are some perceived barriers to really embedding digital literacy skills, attitudes and behavior in the workplace. And the three um, identified barriers are training, infrastructure and organizational culture. Now, we cannot have any, any talk without mentioning the, the good old COVID-19 pandemic. It really, for all its fault, has highlighted, certainly for our workforce, that there are some gaps in terms of, you know, the digital skills that are required to fully utilize the technologies and the digital tools that's been pulled into the system. Having said that, we've obviously, from, from a, a HEE's perspective, there are some real policy drivers that are really underpinning the work that we are doing with the workforce, not to mention, you know, a few, the long-term plan, the people plan, but of note and quite significant in recent years is the TOPO review, which is very much looking at how we develop a digitally ready workforce. For us, developing a digitally ready workforce is not just about skills, it is as, as much about skills as it is about attitudes. As I've already highlighted, the, 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 the rate of change is faster than we can adapt to. So if we carry on focusing on skills, we will never be able to get there. However, if we can get our staff having the attitude of embracing change, then we, we are more likely to have a digitally ready workforce. So just to bring it into, into the personas that we are working with, in terms of we did a discovery in a true digital style, did a discovery to understand what all of this means for our workforce. And that discovery, which was um, reported in 2019, identified three digital personas. I have added a fourth because of what we are more and more seeing, and based on some of the outputs from the um, Lloyd's um, Digital Index and, and, and report. So the three that the discovery identified was people who were digitally positive. And those are your people or your workforce that would be more likely to be engaged. The people that say, yes, tech is going to make a difference, bring it on. And then there is another group, which is your digitally neutral people who usually are ambivalent. So basically talking about, we know that digital will help, but you know what? Please give me my pen and paper or let me stick to the traditional ways of doing things. Now, the third group is our digitally negative, very much go away, I do not do tech. So these are the group of people that usually will be disengaged. And for me, more and more, what's become quite clear is we have an assumption that everybody that works in our services is, you know, has a device or it has access to device. But actually, there are people within our workforce who are digitally excluded. And I think these are a group of people that we need to think about as well in relation to the three other areas. Because if you've got somebody who is digitally negative and excluded, you have a lot more, you, your interventions with them will be different from somebody who is digitally positive and engaged. So I think these are the personas that we need to be very mindful of when we're doing digital in our, in our areas. As Health Education England, we are taking a number of approaches. So there are six approaches highlighted here. It is very much around defining digital literacy and looking at assessment of needs. It is about digital into our undergraduate curricula. It is about specific workforce areas and 
identifying the digital needs that's unique to them. It is also about championship. And I know um, James uh, has mentioned navigation and Tina also alluded to it. There are different names for it. So championship is one of them, digital ambassadors. But this is really important in terms of, you know, local ownership, but also further digital skills. And for me, it's always that the important question in all of this is always the so what? How do we ensure that whilst people are identifying gaps, that we've got training and resources to support them? And again, when we talk digital, how can we make things easier by using digital and technological tools? So I'll pick this up in a few more detail. When you talk about digital, the first reaction you get is our millennials are digitally literate. Now, certainly looking at the definition that Health Education England has given around digital literacy, which is very much the capabilities that fit someone for living, work and learning, participating and thriving in a digital society. It, for me, it doesn't reflect that our millennials are digitally literate. It reflects that there may well be social media savvy or have some literacies in some areas, but not all of it. Now, to quantify this, HEE has looked at a digital capabilities framework that has six domains in there. And those six domains, I mean, some, again, um, James mentioned data. So it's about individuals or our workforce developing skills or literacies in data information and content and such like. So um, th this, I think, for me, underpins all the conversations that we have around digital literacies. So in terms of um, um, defining and assessing digital literacies, what we, what we did based on the capabilities framework is to develop an assessment tool that overlaid that capabilities framework, make it interactive and make it accessible for our workforce. But the two big, I mean, the, the two biggest aims for that tool really is to support identification of digital literacy gaps of the health and care workforce. So individuals can actually use the tool and identify where their strengths are and where there is a learning need. But also as leaders to be able to generate data, data is key to everything we do, to be able to generate data either at a local, regional or national level in understanding and planning and making provisions in terms of learning to support the digital skills development of the workforce. Now, just a quick snapshot of what this self-assessment tool looks like. In, in, in every sense of the word, we have made it accessible and the feedback is suggesting that that's the case. But really, just taking an example of one of the domains, if an individual is assessing themselves, it is very much around where they feel they are now and where they feel they need to be in the context of their role. Remember, this tool is generic and it's 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 there to address the needs of 3.1 million people. So it's, bit, it's that individual having the ability to interpret it in the context of the role. And it's very much on a, on a four point scale as to this is new for me and it's, unf it's new and unfamiliar. Actually, I can do this with a little bit of help or I'm confident in doing this or independently, or I can actually teach others to do it. So these are the four point assessment skill that we're using to understand the points at which our workforce are at. There are a couple of questions in there, which is quite generic in understanding again, learning attitudes. And that is our way of trying to support whether people need, for example, championship or um, navigators or additional support in, in getting them there. Now, once somebody has completed the tool, it, it, the difference between um, um, where they are now and where they need to be is calculated and using algorithms. Again, AI has been mentioned. Recommendation for learning is done for them. We know people are extremely busy and where appropriate, if we can direct people to what they need, it stops them from faffing about, but also it supports them engaging with learning much quicker than they would ordinarily. So that's one of the approaches that we are using. Now, our second approach is very much the understanding that digital can be context specific. How do we ensure that where there are specific workforce needs or service area digital needs that we are beginning to address it? So to this end, various pieces of work have been completed. So we currently have digital therapy. We currently have digital competencies framework 
or um, um, competencies listed for psychological therapies workforce. Again, underpinned by the HE digital capabilities framework in all six domains. We've got one for social workers, allied health professionals. A piece of work is beginning to look at this from a medical perspective. Again, we are looking at primary care as a service area where it, through the COVID um, um, pandemic, digital has really accelerated and beginning to understand what does this mean for the skills um, and the skills of that workforce. And we are certainly looking at this from a mental health perspective as well. Now, a third approach really is digital into undergraduate curricula. I mean, the way we see it, if we do not start incorporating this into undergraduate curricula, then we will never get to the point where we have sufficiently trained or digitally skilled workforce to be able to fully deliver 21st century care. And for us as well, I mean, I am a professional. We all socialized into our profession. So as James always says, see one, do one, teach one. And if you've, if you've seen it and, you know, you've done it through your training, you're more likely to be utilizing it when you, you qualify in a service or to teach others to use it. And the way that we are beginning to start but we're looking at this or we've started looking at this is really through um, various programs that we are commissioning now and um, so we as i said blended learning and utilizing those opportunities to say if people are going to learn using digital and other technologies then that's a way of developing their skills we're also looking at it from uh, an allied health professional perspective and practice learning where does digital lend itself and what opportunities are there for us to develop digital skills through that process. And then medical, again, some medical new, some of our new medical schools are actually using the assessment tool to baseline their student and support their digital skills development throughout their training. Similar pieces of work will be happening with our pharmacy and our dental um, and programs as well. So all of these conversations are beginning to happen and they, there's real traction about how we begin to look at our undergraduate curricula and starting digital skills development from there. Now, our fourth approach, which we've already alluded to a couple of times, is our digital champion, uh, uh, champions and pioneers work. And we've already commissioned a couple of pieces of work around that in terms of maternity championship and social workers, social care workers. But what we've also done is review various models, at least five models, to develop a resource toolkit to basically state what works for who when and how, so that people who are looking into this will be able to have something to go to. Now, our fifth approach really is about the so what. How do we commission and create learning? We always know there are lots and lots of resources in the system. And rather than reinvent the wheel, how can we utilize what we've already got before we develop new ones? And HE has a library and knowledge service with, within its establishment. And they are very pivotal in highlighting what resources are there for us to be able to curate and quality assure what we've got. We use our technology enhanced learning team for the, those purposes as well. But also we are looking at, as, as um, Eric Topol will say, let machines do what machines do best, but let people do what people can do best. So again, having an, a, a resource manager, somebody that will keep their hands, I mean, hands on, on the machine to make sure that we always have high, high, highly curated quality assured resources. And true digital style, see whether there are curation tools that could do that better than we are doing. And our final approach really is around signposting technologies. And as I said, we're currently piloting one that intelligently signposts people to learning that's relevant for them at the time of need, having followed an assessment. Really, what we are keen to understand is the personalization of learning, how that engages people and the types of learning that it allows our workforce to do. So these are our six approaches. I mean, the way that I see it, there's a couple more slides. And I think if, if we focus on the digital skills or literacy development of the workforce, but do not think about the wider context, which is very much around the infrastructure and the culture, highly unlikely that we'll be able to get our workforce to fully utilize and embed their skills in, in the workplace. So the couple of slides, I think James has already done a good 
a, a good overview of these. So I'm just going to highlight them. It's about all our organizations thinking about its people. So not just the skills, but also planning for the future, which is why having data to help them do that is key. So it's about the capability as well. And it's about focusing on user needs. So again, our processes, processes that really will facilitate and not hinder. So we did a piece of work with the Royal College of Nursing and the 900 respondents, some of the feedback was, by the way, if our organizations give us the tool, they shouldn't set policies in place to stop us from using it. And then the technology is key, having technology, the right technology in the right hands, that is when you will get the most effect out of it. So I think it's really key for our organizations to think about the environment that they create for the workforce to fully utilize their skills. And then finally, it is all about culture change. And I, I don't think within our health and care systems, we more often than not take risks. And this is about with digital. And as we all know, sometimes you have to, you know, fail and fail fast and learn from it. So really there are a number of resources or a number of um, um, interventions that others are doing to support us to really embed digital and take those risks and come along with the workforce. And it's very much for me about what digital can do for you rather than, you know, what digital is doing in, in, in the system widely. So I think that's it for me as well. I'll leave it there and hand it back to Kate. Thanks, Henrietta. Um, I'll, I'll take that up before I introduce Kate. Um, I thought your presentation was great. And actually, it was really interesting. I really loved a couple of things about it. I really love the assumption around millennials. I thought that was amazing um, because even just the other day, one of my colleagues told me that in our platform, the oldest patient that had gone through was 103. So that completely goes against the myth of elderly people can't use digital technology. I mean, if it's easy, anybody should, right? Um, and of course, millennials, we're focusing on the millennials have got this education around digital technology, but have they really when it comes to patient care? Um, you know, and their well-being. So I really enjoyed that. Um, the part that I specifically loved was when you were talking about adding digital technology to the undergraduate um, curricula, because for me, I see that digital technology should be a tool for you guys to use, and it should be a tool in amongst everything else. So I would love to see it just just within within the system. You know, it, it's it's part of a consultation and. And, it, and it's part of the flow where it doesn't have to be quite so segmented out anymore. Um, but I really love to bring Kate into the conversation because Kate, you've been doing all of these consultations um, and you have a lot of experience of doing them so far. And I know you have some successes and you have some frustrations. So I'd love to hear about what those are. You know, I mean, we have to be real. So what are the frustrations, that, uh, the challenges that you've had around implementing digital technology? Brilliant. Um, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah fantastic. So um, I was uh, so so my 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 I wear two hats. I'm dean at the Royal College of Psychiatrists, so responsible for uh, uh, training of of all psychiatrists in in the UK and informing that. So fascinated to hear Henrietta's presentation and think about the learning and and, and the skills. Um, and uh, I was fascinated by the uh, description of digital personas. And I was trying to put myself on that that wheel of the four personas and really came to the conclusion that I fluctuate, I think, between them all. I, I don't think I'm terribly negatively disengaged very often, but I do sometimes have to shut the computer down and walk away from it and resist the temptation to throw it out of the window. Um, most of the time I'm, I'm positively engaged, you know, with that fluctuate. But sometimes in the last um, 12 months, I've been digitally excluded for periods of time. So I think what we've we've kind of missed in this discussion uh, is about um, the infrastructure and the, uh, the 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 support, the IT support, because that greatly influences how we all, all, all use it. And I, I've been totting up. I, I reckon I've spent at least 16, possibly more hours, up to 24 hours over the last year, 
uh, with technology failures and in conversations with IT departments. And I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, I did a, a beautiful clinic on a, on a Monday. It worked absolutely fantastically. Uh, came to log into my team's meeting with my team the next morning, didn't work, uh, went straight into clinic and the, 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 the app that we use for CBA care, which is, is, is great. Uh, I, I couldn't hear any of my patients on, 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 on the clinic. So logged a, a call with IT and it took a week of me chasing that call up every day and having to resort to doing my clinics on the phone in the meantime, because I didn't have, uh, the, 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 the support to do that. And, and that, you know, could cut a very long story very short. Um, I've had a, a, a computer uh, that just didn't have enough processing speed, it then took it in to get a chip added, got the chip added, still wasn't up to the job, uh, got a brand new laptop after a couple of months of um, really campaigning very hard to get a new laptop. Uh, and that was intermittently working and it turned out that the BIOS uh, on it wasn't up to date. And, and uh, so that was updated and then um, uh, that hadn't done the trick and the, 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 the laptop, the brand new laptop had to be rebuilt. So I, I suspect that I'm probably not alone in having had that kind of experience. And that does leave uh, people feeling really quite um, uh, excluded at times, but but potentially negatively disengaged. I, I think the thing for me about technology is it's about, you know, how does this benefit patients and putting patients first and foremost. I work in a, a, a sort of forward thinking organization, which was uh, about to adopt um digital consultations um, prior to the pan pandemic. It had, it had sorted itself out with, with, with the software and so on. But we then suddenly found ourselves in COVID and uh, I'd volunteered to trial it. That, that was brought forward to just get on with it. And um, thank goodness, thank goodness that we had that good to go because uh, I know that, that many organizations were uh, not uh, so far ahead of, of, of the curve. And it's meant that we can, you know, we've, we've managed to keep consultations going during the pandemic. Uh, I was glad that Henrietta mentioned, however, about those who are digitally excluded. I work in a very deprived part of, of Plymouth. Uh, and many of my patients um, simply don't have the, the, uh, the the hardware, uh, they don't have the data, they live uh, chaotic uh, lives uh, and, and so on. So it's not a panacea and for many of our patients at the moment are, are, are excluded from it. When it does work, it works brilliantly. And I think uh, in terms of power differentials, that's been really interesting because it means that patients have a lot more control over their own environment. So people have chosen to, to, to beam in from holiday abroad, from cafes, uh, I, 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 and so on. And there's always a bit of, you know, checking out that it's confidential and that they're happy with the environment and, 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 and so on. We've had, uh, people running through their houses because their dogs just escaped through the front door. Um, so you do get that glimpse that, that James has described into, people's wider, wider lives that you don't get in a very um, uh, clinical, austere uh, setting in our NHS um, clinics. So I'm very, very grateful that we've, we've, we've had that. I think we need to uh, finesse our, our, our skills. We just kind of had to get on with it and make the best of it. But I think that there, there, is, a, there is a time and it's important that we, uh, you know, really go back to thinking carefully about how we can maximize our, our, our use of it, because I don't think um, certainly on the ground where I am that, that, that we're there yet. But um, I'll stop there. And um, so, I, I, I will just say, actually, Kate, all credit to Live Well. I know that within a space of I think it was literally two weeks, um, you guys had trained over 800 users. Yep. Um, in our solution. So all, all credit for that. I think that's absolutely amazing. But what can we do about the IT infrastructure? You know, I mean, because you could have suppliers like us running around night and day trying to give you solutions. But if you don't have yeah. a laptop yeah. to be yeah. able to use it, to be able yeah. to deliver the efficiency savings that you need to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in a catch 22, isn't it? Yeah. So what can we do about that? And um, James, You've probably got some thoughts around this. What can we do? <laughs> well, I mean, 
I, I'm just from an Oxy's point of view in the middle of in the middle of April and May last year, April to May last year, it was and it still is very, very difficult to get your hands on new laptops. They just disappeared. I mean, you know, to the point where I think some uh, colleagues in uh, organizations were, were going to sort of high street retailers to try and get some laptops in order that people could, you know, because the usual suppliers and I, I think it is. So I think there was a genuine problem getting new kit at that point. I think I think there is a a wider conversation and it goes back to my sort of RSA matrix of what do we want to keep doing and what do we want to do differently of thinking about how we spend our money um or and this is something we're doing in oxley's at the moment we had a conversation yesterday about it in terms of thinking about our digital estate as much as our physical estate and thinking about you know if all the cash we have to spend what's the what's the way that delivers i mean i'm using that word again agility at the moment i think we we've we've historically spent it probably more on real estate if you like digital uh, physical estate i think that problem needs to change um and is changing for many organizations so i think it's something about but underneath that is kind of having an agreement with our staff and our patients about what's the best way of providing care before we make those choices you know um so i think i think that's part of it it's just that kind of conversation about where are we spending our money and what's the, what delivers the best uh, value in terms of that agility brilliant can i ask a question around where we touched on patients managing their care. Um, I know in, we're a Swedish company, Receivers a Swedish company, so I have the comparisons of the two regions. Um, in the UK, we don't like to have patient-initiated follow-ups and patient-initiated bookings. There seem to, seems to be um, a, a reticence around that, a shyness around that. Um, whereas in, in Sweden, they, they fly with it and they have incredibly low dna rates of like two percent because of that whereas here ours are higher but we're stopping ourselves from doing that why do you think that is who, who, who would you like to answer that well i could i'll ask all of you <laughs> um uh i'm interested in kate's experience i suppose i i i, I i'm I, i'm happy to give an answer but kate do you have an or henrietta do you have any thoughts yeah i mean um I think this whole sort of experience over COVID really has, I, th I think is helping us ask the hard questions about what we do and, and, and why. Um, and although, you know, Irving Goffman wrote about um, uh, institutionalization in, in, in his uh, book, Asylums, uh, you know, way back, still many of our practices uh, in the health service are very institutionalized and uh, we do things because we do them a particular way and, and outpatient clinics, not just in mental health, but throughout the whole healthcare system, you know, we have a whole uh, sort of institutional thing around of that um, uh, I, 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 and I think you know we, we do have to ask why we are seeing people you know on three monthly follow-ups or six monthly follow-ups and, and actually what is the point of each uh, uh, kind of consultation um, but we've got whole admin structures whole management structures whole outcome uh, measures and so on that they're, they're all based around of that but yeah in an ideal world you know this should be being um, really driven by patients we should be giving them choices about you know when they want to see us how they want to see us uh, one of the things that worries me is sort of top-down directives about we should be in improving our rates of uh, digital consultations and that's all very well but 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 that should be individually uh, driven and I would hate for us to be sort of you know uh, hitting targets with that but missing the point because we are then missing the people who actually for very good reasons want to speak to us on the phone they do not want us to uh, to, to be contacting them um, you know by video link so I think from my perspective, and certainly coming from a workforce perspective as well, I always remember when we started the topo review and some of the discussions, I think it raised a lot of anxiety among the workforce in thinking, oh my goodness, we're all going to be re replaced by robots to do our jobs and actually we wouldn't have any job to do 
because once you bring in the digital, it takes over. And two things happen then in terms of the conversation. By, I mean, as I've already alluded to, Eric said, let, let the um, uh, machines do what machines do best so that who, whoever is signed up to becoming a care professional can do the caring because that's what we sign up to do. So if there are technologies that can read the scans, that can do things that does it quicker and more uh, accurately, then why not? And some of the conversations that I certainly have had with people is saying, actually, from an organizational perspective, from a workforce organization's perspective, we know that we haven't actually got the numbers of the workforce that we need. So where possible, if we can start thinking about how we utilize technologies to help us do our jobs better, then why wouldn't we do that? Having said that, there is a big piece around the cultural change and the shift because more and more we will see that with our patients and our users having access to their own data and you know managing their own health that the, 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 there would be a power shift and some of it i don't think our individual um, workforce or individual practitioners are ready for it so there there is some work to be to be done around that but i certainly agree that you know if we start looking at it we probably gain a lot more from it than we, we don't i mean i certainly do some teaching around you know culture and diversity and implications for mental health practice and the one point that i do pick up on is the unspoken or the unconscious processes that happen you give people appointments they do not turn up and you're wondering why haven't they turned up? So some of it, it, it really is for us to examine some of these factors as Kate has already mentioned and be able to start turning turning the tables the other way. Turn the tables. James, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I suppose I, I rather controversially, I, I think um, I think it's important that where where it's meaningful to offer choice in terms of when your appointment is, I think that's important. I think staff staff protect their autonomy in order to manage their own health and we've, we you know we're thinking about mental health of our own mental health workforce i think being in control of your diary it is one way that a lot of people uh, manage their own mental health in terms of pacing themselves i think it's important to reflect on that but one thing i wanted to just kind of highlight where choice may not be helpful is one of the things we're looking at in our community, uh, in our community services, our, our just sort of district nursing services, is kind of route planning for our district nurses, so that actually they can, they can, we can tell a patient when they're going to come, rather than get, rather, you know, in a much more um, accurate way. You know, at the moment, it's like, we'll come and see you in the morning. You know, it's a bit like one of those vague delivery slots you get. And actually, what would be helpful is if we could send them a text message 15 minutes before saying, you know, um, our, your district nurse is 15 minutes away. They'll they'll be with you shortly or they've been delayed, which is important because actually their previous visit needed a lot more care for whatever reason. So I think and that's less about choice and just more about customer ex customer experience in terms of knowing what's going on and I go back to that idea of I think people are comfortable if they know what's going on if it, and I think that's where technology and learning from other uh, health uh, sorry non-healthcare settings um, might help us in terms of that customer experience you know if, if where choice isn't necessarily always possible or the best outcome for all yeah and I think patients I mean patients expect it now don't they but I mean everything is just you know for the, for the population we can access everything so very easily, but then we have to have a schedule of appointments and then we, you know, we have to wait six months before we can see somebody. Um, we only have a few minutes left before we have the end of our session. So I'd just like to invite everybody to please put a question in the chat if you'd like me to ask Kate, Henrietta or James um, any of the questions there. I know that we've had questions regarding the evidence that I mentioned. So please do have a look on the Placebo Care website um, because it's actually a collection of different papers that, that we've collated. So you have lots of different references there that, that I think you'll find really very interesting. Um, I'll just have a quick look in the chat there. What would be your, let me ask, what would be your top tips? Um, Kate, I'll start with you. What would be your top tips for people who would be starting to build their own digital practice? Oh, gosh. So. Um, 
I mean, my experience is, is of not building my own digital experience, but, but working with an organization and doing that collectively with, 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 with other um, uh, colleagues. Um, I think, you know, going back to the points, make, making sure that you've got the, the right kit and that you've got the right support um, uh, backup uh, f f for that, making sure that you've got the right um, admin infrastructure that you've got, because this is all absolutely, you know, success or failure is absolutely hinges on your admin staff doing the, the background um, work and fixing up appointments and, and, and links and, and, and so on. Um, I haven't had the experience of having a digital uh, navigator, but I, I dearly would have loved that. That would have been extremely helpful to have done some preparatory work with patients ahead of the appointment. So to talk through a lot of the basic stuff about confidentiality and so on, uh, allay people's fears. We had some people who were worried they were going to be um, recorded and, you know, without their permission and all, all this sort of stuff. So that would have, you know, really seriously think about um, investing uh, in, in a support person that can do a lot of the, the, the prep um, work and have a think. Uh, again, I, I, again, I just went into this, you know, with no training, just got on with it uh, as an experienced clinician. But actually, I think um, James's um, idea about doing some simulation uh, training ahead of it, having a play, um, really kind of uh, getting some good feedback about your consultation skills and how you need to adapt them to a digital environment. Those would be my, my advice. Thank you. Henrietta. I mean, as I said earlier, the three things is about people, it's about processes, and it's about the technology, which Kate has already mentioned. And if you can focus on those, bearing in mind the type of personas that you're dealing with, and really getting the biggest investment from board level leadership, because that's the other piece that we have been, do we, we have been doing in Health Education England, getting boards to understand what it truly means to be able to have an organization that really is investing in digital, I think would be key in terms of being able to set things up. Thank you. James, last word with you. I mean, Kate's already kind of highlighted my point about simulation. I think it mm -hmm. is about being deliberative. And I think one of the things is just thinking about what you're doing and, 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 and if simulation uh, and kind of gives you the space to do that, to reflect with others, to, to, to have that kind of mindfulness uh, when you, you know, awareness when you're in the room and just notice what you're doing, um, perhaps even more so. Um, I think, um, and I think that's an important part of mental health practice generally, is just being mindful of what are your feelings and what are the feelings of the people that you're working with. You know, your feelings about technology might get in the way of you actually using technology, which is better. For the, for the patient and gives them a better experience because otherwise they wouldn't make it to your clinic. You know, I'm thinking about people with uh, who, who struggle to get out of doors because of an anxiety disorder, perhaps because of a physical health condition. You know, for them, if your feelings get in the way of you delivering care via technology, that's not helpful for them. So it's kind of being, that's just that awareness of ourself, I think, and, and managing our own feelings about it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Kate, Henrietta and James. I thought it was a really incredible, valuable discussion. And thank you to everybody for listening. Um, if we from Placebo Care, if we can have a tour, please just pop over to our website. We'd be happy to share some of our learnings um, with you. And of course, if you have any questions that you'd like to send through, then we can also put them to Kate, James and Henrietta at a later date, I'm so sure. So thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.